Is this is this mic? Is this recording? Can you hear me? With the, can y'all hear me out there? No. Somebody said no. Can you hear me back there? Can you hear me now? No. <laughs> I can. I can do all things through Christ. <laughs> I know all the scriptures. Testing one. See, is that better? Yes. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm not sure about the good stuff or the new book. It's, it's not really new, but uh, Blood Works is uh, a book that the Lord led me to write about uh, the analogy between the blood of Jesus Christ and our own blood and how that applies to the body of Christ. And so uh, it is an instructive book to challenge Christians about uh, the power of the blood. And really in the book, I talk about where I believe that the body of Christ in the earth is the blood of Jesus. So, uh, again, if we don't cover things tonight, you may want to receive a copy, and I'll certainly autograph it for you, but it, it really, the opening chapter is called Wonder and Design. And, and, and they asked me to talk about really that, that balance between uh, faith uh, and medicine, or faith and, and how we deal, deal with the academic side of our, of our lives. I will tell you this, that um, I can tell a hundred stories over the last 30 or 40 years uh, about not, not the, the adversarial role of faith in science, but the complementary role. And the book talks about that, that really if you understand science in its purest nature, uh, it comes from God. So there is no competition. I think there's a lack of understanding oftentimes in the body of Christ certainly in our culture, in our background about, you know, if you go to a doctor or you uh, practice medicine, can you do that and have faith? And I, I always say, I see no conflict. Because the same God uh, who gave us faith is the same God who caused us to discover DNA and to understand mitochondria and things like that. There is, there is no competition, this is a lack of knowledge. So I'm glad to be here tonight. Thank you, Mary, for having me come. Uh, I fault Tommy for not being here. He's on his way to Nairobi, uh, and he, when he and I talked a couple of days ago. He said, Doc, I'm really glad you're coming. I said, I'm looking forward to seeing you, Tom. Oh, I'll be on the plane going to Nairobi. I said, all right, I'll, I'll come anyway. So um, the, the beauty of tonight for me is that, you know, I love to lecture. I love to talk. I love to uh, give sessions, but I really love to talk about what I do and what I think I'm called to do. Uh, and I understand that, again, this audience is at least uh, a great part of it, are people with a medical background. And one of the issues is always, you know, how do I use my skills? How do I use my abilities? And, and more importantly and specifically, how do I use my calling uh, in medicine to glorify God and to build the kingdom? So again, um, Tom said, talk about your beginning, talk about some of your challenges uh, and then just open it up. So tonight, you know, I, I can speak for five minutes and listen to you and you can ask questions. I can talk for 45 minutes. I'm just glad to, to be here. Let me, let me start by asking you this. Let's go around the room and tell me who you are, just very briefly, and what your background is, if it's in medicine or not. And let's start over here. You, I know who this is. Speak up, y'all, so everybody can hear you. Martin. I work with the Social Security Administration. All right. Janetta Wilson. I'm formerly um, in the med mental health field, but I'm looking to get back. LJ Garner, a clinical psychologist in private practice. Deborah Beasley, clinical psychologist. I'm not partial at all. <laughs> I'm Pam Willis, uh, program administrator at Advocate Illness Fund. Good evening, Lakeitha Jackson, uh, registered nurse and ministry. Uh, I'm JC Bicek, and I work for a healthcare service corporation. Uh -huh. I'm Erin Gettle, and I'm a nurse at 
You guys in medicine? Yes. What do you, what do you wear in? He's entrepreneur, he owns businesses, he doesn't want to say that. Yes. Uh, Joseph McGee, as a bad performer and in tennis for that. Go Bulls. <laughs> oh, I'm Lena Valentine. I'm a missionary doctor of a pediatrician and an author and speaker. Wow. Where? I'm at the Warrior Missions Missions mm -hmm. in the uh, a tundra of bowling ball, Illinois. The tundra, I like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, some of these cities there. They're definitely mission fields, without a, without a doubt. Uh, I'm Allison Bird. I'm a pediatric social therapist. I'm Allison Yarrock. I'm a clinician. Great. Oh, hi. I'm Maria Huspinskaya. I work in market research, but I work with uh, healthcare companies. Emily Sproul, doctoral student of clinical psychology. Wow. I'm Marcy. I'm a physical therapist. Ryan Daniels, I have a background in management. I've previously been a director of a nursing home. Mm -hmm. I introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys are with me. Very eclectic group. All right, so who wants to ask the first question? I can, I can just start with medicine. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about my background. So I grew up in Chicago uh, on the south side, and um, I was the first person in my, my family to, to go to college. So it was a big deal. Uh, but also I've been involved uh, with uh, our church really as a, as a young person. And you have to have appreciation for the, the background and the culture of our church. So I belonged to what was called a Pentecostal church. And so I can remember growing up in the church and... Uh, having these wild ideas about being a physician and uh, in my early teens sharing what we called the, the, the people in the church called the saints, you know, what I want to be. And I remember telling him one day I was about maybe 15, 16, you know, I'm going to be a doctor. He said, wait a minute. Oh, no, you can't be a doctor. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we don't believe in doctors. We believe in Jesus. And Jesus is a healer, so we don't believe in doctors. I had a very insightful pastor Maybe a few weeks after that, he said to me, he said, what's wrong with you? I said, nothing. He said, no, something's wrong with you. you, you it's like you're depressed. So I said, I said, I said, well, I was sharing with some people about, you know, my dream about being a doctor. He said, yeah. And he said, and they told me that, you know, in our church, we don't believe in doctors. We believe in Jesus. He said to me, he said, son, people told you that those are very good people and they're dead wrong. You know, stay in school. God's going to use you in an unusual way. And my point is that um, you have to have people uh, in your life that, I believe this theologically, that can look into your heart and see that God has a role for your life. And the role may not always be the cookie cutter, you know, uh, uh, quote unquote normal route that God may have something else for you. So in our, in our background, we, we didn't have uh, nurses and doctors and technicians. You know, we believed that God was a healer, and that was it. And some of those old-timers in my background, they were very proud that they, you know, I never went to a doctor, I don't take medicine. But, you know, what would usually happen, they'd get older and things would happen, and, and then they would be co-opted by their families or whatever. But um, medicine, uh, to me, was very intriguing. You know, I was a typical nerd growing up on the south side of Chicago. Uh, I had four, five brothers and sisters. Uh, they laughed at me because I was a typical nerd. I like to read the dictionary, stuff like that, kind of crazy stuff. Yeah, I would read dictionaries for hours and, and encyclopedias. I thought that was, you know, uh, so adventurous to read about things. And I can remember the first time I looked in a microscope, I was like floored, like, wow, <laughs> man, look at this. This is so great. So yeah, and I had the big Coke bottle glasses and everything as a little kid. And, and I was picked on a little bit, but I had an older brother who was a tough guy, so I went, when he got beat up once. After that, nobody touched me because my brother didn't play that. <laughs> but, but the point is that, you know, so I grew up in, in that environment, but I was encouraged. And um, I have to admit, as I traversed through school and, and uh, even in medical school, you know, I was challenged because it wasn't easy. And, and sometimes I'd wonder, well, maybe I'm out of God's will. Maybe that's what that really is about. I'm trying to you know, do this and that, and, uh, and as I was nurtured and as I was developed, 
with my mentor as I began to understand that God uh, puts things in your heart to become. So anybody out there who's in the medical field, you may be challenged by it. Um, I, I get asked this question in, in a number of venues all the time about the conflict uh, between, again, uh, faith and science. I've lectured at, at Yale, I've lectured at Howard and many universities across the country uh, presenting, talking about, the, again, the issue, the complementary role of who God is, and especially to Christians, to, to challenge them about what is their thought about God. You know, all of you in this room can probably quote scripture. The Bible says, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. And we understand that. We look up in the, you know, in the universe and we're awed by what we see. We, we see the systematic way of the universe and, and the precise way of planets and things like that. And we're like, wow, man, God is great. And, and so in my book, and Augustine says this, that, that men uh, cover the vast spaces of oceans. They, they climb the, the high altitudes of mountains and they're awed at the things that God has done, but they walk by themselves and fail to wonder. The, the human body to me is, is, is an astounding, creative act of God. Um, the way it's put together, the way it operates is nothing less than amazing. Um, a human birth always takes my breath away. It's an amazing thing, th this thing called being human. But when you understand the scripture, it says we are made in God's image, after his likeness. So it's no surprise to me that a God who is magnificent has put us together. And so one young lady in the audience here today stopped us and told me about somebody who kind of forgot about her brother who I took care of 20 some years ago, uh, who had non Hodgkin's lymphoma and what God did in that situation. And so I can tell you that as a physician, young physician being challenged by my faith, um, it was unusual, but I always had a sense that God had a call in my life. And, and I like to think that, you know, what we do as professionals, what we do in our uh, various work ethics, that's just what we do. That's not really what we are. If you, if you, if you are a child of God, your purpose is not what you do. Your purpose is a vehicle God uses to allow you to do what you do. And, and so I've been privileged in so, in so many areas uh, in medicine to, to deal with those kinds of things. And, and so when you talk about God's creative power, it's an amazing thing. A couple of my experiences. So I can remember uh, becoming a hematologist. Uh, it was my lifelong dream. A guy by the name of George Honig, who was probably one of the world's foremost hemoglobinopathists, was at the University of Illinois. And so they recruited me to go to medical school there. And I walked through with him. And, I can remember uh, how God opened doors for me, and I knew it was the Lord. Um, having done that, I became a hematologist, um, matriculated through uh, medical school, a residency, a fellowship program at both University of Illinois and Northwestern, and, and had a great experience. I can remember becoming the director of the comprehensive sickle cell thalassemia program at Northwestern, you know, high position, never thought a boy from the South Side would, we would do that. And I, and I got a call from a group called World Vision. You know, I'm with World Vision. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, the guy who called me was a pastor. He said, Dr. I'm calling you because uh, we're going on this trip. Uh, there's this thing called HIV AIDS. We know that you have some experience with it. And we have this, this big meeting in New York. This is like 35 years ago. And we want you to come and join us uh, so you can uh, experience what we experience about HIV AIDS. And, you know, I said to myself, you know, this guy's calling me about going to this, this convention about HIV AIDS. I know the top and the bottom about HIV AIDS because I took care of kids with hemophilia. I can remember in the early 80s when our children began to get sick and they began to die and we had, we had no clue how they were dying. I can remember then about a year later, this, we were discovering that it was a virus that was killing these children in one of the hardest years of my life sitting down with about 50 parents and say to them, we know what your kid has, but we have no way to cure it or treat it. Was my faith challenge? Absolutely. These are children. These are not people who have, quote unquote, done wrong. These, these are young kids, as young as three or four months of age up until teenage years, and they were dying. I remember we were able to develop this thing called AZT, one of the first uh, drugs for HIV. And so I went on a trip to, 
to, to New York very smug about what I knew and uh, having taken care of these kids and, and so forth. And then I met some people from Africa who had HIV, who didn't fit the mold that we Americans you know, thought about HIV. And I will tell you that uh, in our church and in many of our churches, uh, many of us you know, felt like HIV was a curse from God against homosexuals. And I met millions of people who were not homosexual. They had HIV too, and they were dying. And so my smugness was quickly evaporated, and I realized that God had a role for me to play in what a disease I thought I knew about. But here's my point, uh, sub-point to that. I was able to work with researchers, and, and we were amazed that we discovered that HIV would incorporate itself into T cells. Most of you know what T cells are. T cells work as a type of a, a white blood cell that fights against certain pathogens and engulfs bacteria and other pathogens. And then your B cells, they really develop antibodies. If you get exposed to a virus or fungus and your B cell can make an antibody. And so with HIV, HIV would encompass T cells and then they would take over the DNA uh, of the T cell and, and kill the cells. So the virus itself didn't kill you, it would destroy your T cells. So you would get common diseases that would, would kill you. And we were amazed as we did research that B cells that we knew were dedicated to produce <clears throat> antibodies were able to mutate and become T cells. And I said, wow, how'd they do that? So all of my friends would tell me about, you know, the issues of chance and how things, I would say to them, so how, how did your body know that you lack T cells and how do committed B cells become T cells? Who told them to do that? How did they know how to do that? Because I would tell my friends that that's really God. They say, yeah, we know you could say that's all. That's all. I say, that's God. I mean, that's pre-programmed. Clearly, that's not a chance occurrence. Something has to be innate in the cell to be able to do that. And they said, well, we don't know what it is, but I know what you're going to say is God. I said, it is God. It, it, I said, the, the problem with us is that you don't know, I do know, and so don't be mad at me by telling you what happens. <laughs> I can tell you about children with one young man with a disease called Rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, um, who was diagnosed at 18 months of age and was treated uh, with first-line drugs, we first developed drugs called like cisplatinum, things like that, and he got the highest dose of cisplatinum of anybody who ever gotten cisplatinum, uh, and, and we eradicated, we thought his sarcoma, uh, he was disease-free, and then two years later, he had a relapse. And we had to treat him with secondary drugs and so forth, and, and I can remember uh, working with this young man and his family, and. When you work with people who have things like HIV or cancer, uh, you're not just you know, remotely attached to them. You get to know them, their families, their fathers, their grandfathers, their cousins, their friends, uh, and so forth. And, and, and people would warn me and say, you know, Doc, you get too close to your families. But that was the ministry part of me. And, and I began to understand that part, that that's what God sent me. I would ask the Lord, why did you let me study ministry and all these things, then go to medical school, and I knew what I was going to do, and then make me a pastor. That doesn't make any sense to me. But of course, God has all sense. He knows the end at the beginning. And so working with, with this, this, this young boy, and, and my colleagues said to me, now Horace, you know, you've gotten too close to the family. It's time to let go. He's going to die. I said, no, he's not going to die. Now, was that my faith talking? I think it was, but it was also my commitment. And one thing I'll tell you, as I hope I digress too much, I believe that when you're called to medicine, you're called to ministry because you're called to care. You know, there, there are people who are great academicians, but they're poor caregivers. They're not humane enough. They're not, they're not enough in touch with their humanity to be a good health care provider because people are not diagnoses. They're not numbers. They are people. And, and so long story short, my, my colleagues, and, and rightly so, would tell me, you know, you need to back away from this family. And I was, you know, very adamant because I had some clouded Northwestern. And I demanded, no, we're going to retreat him. We're going to do what we call cherry picking of his lungs and pick out some of those, you know, metastases and then treat him. And they said, it's all for nothing. And I remember saying to him, no, he's going to live. And, and after about three or four courses of treatment, 
he was in remission again, and he lived. And I will tell you that that young man lived another 15 years, finished college, um, became a professional, and my faith was boosted. I write about him in my book. And then about 10 years after that, he, he had a secondary malignancy from the chemotherapy and, and radiation. Here's my point to you is that I do believe that you have to be called to medicine to be really good. You're called to ministry. And as I tell my church all the time, faith is not a risk-free business. Sometimes your faith will be challenged to the point where you will wonder what's going on. But that's the wonder of God. And so people say, you know, you've seen all these great things and then you've seen terrible disasters. How do you acclimate that to your faith? Now tell them that there's some things that we'll never understand on this side of heaven. But we do walk by faith and not by sight. And science is to be applied to bless people, according to St. John 10 and 10. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but God has come to give us life. And so healthcare workers are not the devil's tools. They couldn't be. They bring too much hope to people. They bring real life. They lessen suffering. The, the issues of, of that young man challenged me on, on a number of fronts. In all those things, I believe that God got the glory. I know the people that he touched in his life. I can tell you about his family, tell you about his background. And so um, for me, when people tell me, you know, how do you do all that you do and you do too much? They don't understand that I just do what I'm called to do. When, when, when you're in, a, in an area that you're called to, to do and you have a commitment to that, it is rarely arduous. Even though the hours are long sometimes and sometimes, the, you know, you cannot be detached. Another story, I remember uh, my first patient who was about 17, 18, <coughs> who died from lymphoma. And I remember when I met this young man, I, I, I won't break HIPAA laws, I won't tell you his name or his background, but I remember when we met him, he said to me after about two weeks, he said, you know, you're one of the squarest dudes I ever met in my life. <laughs> That's what he said to me. He said, he said, you know nothing about life. And he was, do, he, he, was, he was doing something. He was playing some music. I came in his room. I said, man, what's it all about? He said, man, that's Cool Mo D. I went, how many of y'all know who Cool Mo D is? See, I, I had no clue what a cool, I couldn't know a Cool Mo D from a Kool-Aid bottle. Was. <laughs> so he made a pack. He said, he said, Dr. Smith, I tell you what, teach me about medicine and my disease. I'll teach you about Cool Mo D and how to be sharp. <laughs> and so I took care of him, you know, for a year or two and he grew very attached. And he died. It's a tough thing. His mother came to me the first time. She said, you know what, Dr. Smith? I want you to do my son's funeral. I went, wait a minute. Can I do that? And so I was part of a large group of physicians. And they said, they said we told you, you're too close to your patients. You should not do his funeral. That's too much. You cannot be able to deal with that in the proper way. So I went to his mom and said, that, you know, I, I really think I shouldn't do it. And she went ballistic. She said, my son loved you, and you love him. Why can't you do his funeral? And so again, it's one of those points in my life I have to rethink what I'm called to do. And ask myself, where does my ministry end? Does it end with chemotherapy? Does it end with prayers at the bedside? Or does it continue to what people need even when they have had a tragic loss in their life. And, and so I can tell you that the, the combination of ministry in a, in a classical sense in medicine for me is never a con, is, is rarely a conflict. I, I think God is in charge. I'm just not always aware of his doings, but we are his, his instruments. We are his students. We are his servants. I tell my church sometimes laughingly, but I, but I mean it very seriously that the Lord does not ask you, are you comfortable doing something if he calls you to it? He asks you, will you do it? Discomfort does not mean it's not God's will. It means we have to sometimes grow. And you talked about with communication, the three, um, with circulation, the three areas. Yeah, how do you engage people? Where does it begin and end? What is your calling? And, and so with that family, I learned some things. And, and then from that, you know, I began to do funerals and other things at, at the hospital to the point of, of that they, they started to have a yearly um, service to honor those who had died under our care. And I was their speaker many, many times. And I can tell you that I grew through that experience when parents would tell us, 
you don't know what you mean to us. And we go, yeah, but we, we lost the case. No, you, they knew you, you're limited, but you allowed us to be people going through valleys. You gave us hope. You gave us comfort sometimes. You know, um, one young man, true story, um, he, he was dying. His mother called me and said, you need to come see him because he said he will not die. I mean, things like that, like, I'm like, wow, that has to be God. So my, my point is that my journey has taught me that in Christianity, we have to sometimes push the envelope and understand where God is. Um, and if we have the courage to do that, you will have experiences that, you know, you can do like, you can write about. And the, you know, I tell people, you, you can tell me to doubt God all you want to, but you're too late because I was there when he did miracles. And, you know, at the hospital, when we moved, when we, uh, at Children's Memorial, the, it's now Lurie Children's, uh, when we added the first dedicated cancer unit, the, uh, the head of the hospital called me and said, look, we are the only hospital that we know of who has a, who has a hematologist who's a bishop. We want you to dedicate these instruments before we put them on the floor. So I actually had to go down there with my robes and all that stuff and, and pray for the CT scans and things like that. And, and I was very humbled by that. I realized, wow. You know, God has a way if we are instruments in his hands to use us. And, and so I can tell you countless stories of where I've learned that there is no conflict between faith and science. There are sometimes, you know, what Paul says, what uh, now we see through a glass darkly, then face to face. Some things we, we do not understand. Remember, faith does not require you to understand it. Faith requires us to trust. And, and that's, that's a, sometimes a difficult walk. But I'll tell you, it's very rewarding. So I, so I, yeah, I have uh, patients now who are, you know, 30 and 40 years old who I've seen grow up. I can remember a, another case, a young man who had uh, leukemia, who his father was one of the top rabbis in the city. I took care of him, and uh, he had a rough time with, with his leukemia. He had to have radiation, testicular radiation, and things like that. Uh, but he survived. And I remember that when he finished chemotherapy and three years later we, we said he was cured, his father brought him to, to see me and said, you know, he's here to see you today and he has something to tell you about our, our Jewish faith. And he said, he said, Dr. Smith, uh, in our faith, when you save a life, that life must be given back. So he said, you saved my life. I, I, I didn't say that. No, you saved my life. So I'm going to give my life back. I'm going to become a rabbi. He became a rabbi. Three years later, he called me from New York, almost screaming, Dr. Smith, Dr. Smith, you won't believe what? My wife is pregnant. I mean, just amazing. Now he has three children. He wasn't supposed to have any. But, but again, those kinds of things um, just meant to me again that, you know, God's ways are not our ways, uh, but he can use us in miraculous ways. So sometimes you may be challenged by what you're called to do, and you may not have all these experiences that I've had, but... You have some like that. I'm sure the lady back there who was in missions, um, you know, I've traveled to Asia and Africa and South America. I've seen things that are just amazing to make me appreciate what we have, but also give back because, you know, that's again a part of compassion and caring and healing. You know, the Lord said, if you don't do it to the least of these, you have not done it unto me. So, yeah, we really are... We, we are ministers and we are servants. Um, like I was saying, I'll, and I'll stop and open up for questions. Um, it is an amazing thing what people allow us to do. Remember, to be in healthcare, people must trust, trust you. You know, healthcare access is not a matter of is there a clinic near my house with a good reputation. People don't trust you, they won't go to where, where you practice medicine. And so I, I do st uh, talks also about medicine in, in so certain social economic groups and the disparities. I tell them sometimes healthcare access has nothing to do with the hospital that's three blocks away. Because if you don't engage with people and they don't trust you, they won't go to you until it's almost too late. Because there's no, there's no relationship. And, and so even in that, I, you know, I tell our, you know, our, again, as the last story, I remember children years ago, they came in and said, we want you to teach, a, to develop a six weeks course. I said, what is it going to be about? He said, look, we have the best and the brightest minds in the world who become resident at our hospital, but they often have no people skills. He said, we've watched you, how you work with people. 
So I wrote a curriculum called, curriculum called Medicine is Ministry, six week course that our secondary residents had to take to know how to treat people, not just a diagnosis. You, you know who gets sued in medicine? Not bad doctors, those who don't engage with people. You can be a bad doctor and you take care of people the best you can, you rarely get sued. But if you're aloof and disengaged and arrogant, so they, they were not just doing me, they said, look, you know, you've been here for 37 years, you have never been named in a suit, ever. And I, had, I, I was once, when I was first year resident at the University of Illinois, I was the seventh person on that list because I took care of a kid and I wrote too much better, good of a note that talked about his pulses, that's not the whole story. But that was when I was a, I was a first year resident, of course it got settled, and since that time I've been in medicine since 1975 and never been named to a lawsuit. But again, a roundabout way to tell you that medicine is a calling. What you do is important. You know, I heard you know physical therapists here and people in pharmacy and healthcare administration. I believe that God uses all these things together. You know, the what Ephesians passage uh, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. Each one critical in the welfare of God's people. Holistic medicine means that we work together with the community as a team, uh, and we bring about resources uh, and abilities that allow them to be better, then God is glorified. So that's why I was glad to, be, to come tonight. Tonight, is, these kind of things are always easy for me because I can remember being that young boy, being discouraged by what they told me and thinking, you know, I'm out of place. Then I realized that maybe God has a role for your life. And so uh, I'm committed to encouraging others to be the best you can be in your field to get good counsel from people that have experience. Uh, but don't limit God. He, he may be using you in an unusual way that people really need it, and you become that need. So I know that we're supposed to stop at 8 o'clock. Let me stop here and open up for questions or comments. Not everybody at one time. <laughs> Yeah, I've had some experience. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there's a ton of work of um, really profound mentors that you had throughout the course. Yeah, you, you know, I, I had mentors in the church who were people of faith who I think what, the way they helped me was uh, th that they didn't always understand my call, but they, they had enough maturity to say to me that my, my pastor, Bishop Holly, taught me uh, some about Romans 12, he said to me, you don't, have, you, have, you don't have to know God's will to do his will. He said, follow, follow Romans 12, 1 and 2. It, you know, it tells us to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. He said, if you make yourself available to God in faith, he said, I guarantee you, he, he will lead you the way you ought to go. Things like that, that, you know, so people like that. There were also people, you know, that, again, as I went through school, you know, I had teachers and others who, who were terrific mentors who encouraged the best out of me, who also would not let me be mediocre. And that's one of my pet peeves that we, you know, we, especially among some certain cultures, we lower the bar with kids. We don't want them to work hard. No, no, if you don't, if you don't push that child, if you don't draw to them the best, they will never achieve what they have in them. They may not even know what they have in them. In fact, one of my theologies is that you have to, we as a generation above people have to see in them what they cannot see in themselves and call it out of them. You must call those things that are not as if they already are for them to have the hope that they can become it. So, yeah, it's important to be attached to people who are actually walking in faith but who have a commitment to faith that does not hold them in, in the status quo. It's important not to be reckless but not to just stay on a certain line. Maybe God has something else. And so those people have always, for me, you know, I, I believe, it's, I mean, God, I believe God sets people up like me. He just, set, he just set me up. You know, I can talk about tragedy in my life, my mother's death, things like that. You know, well, I never wish, wish on anybody, but those things cause me to be directed in a certain manner, a certain way. You know, what the enemy may mean for evil, God will bring it to good. So, but you do need. You need, I think you need to have mentors, you need to have a team around you, people that you answer to. And, th and that's what I think is lacking often today is that we don't answer to anybody. We are, we, we are prisoners of our, of our own selves, and that's a terrible thing. 
Because when you are your own mentor, you're limited just to you. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's always a question I always get. How do you balance medicine, faith, and your family? What I try to do is see them, again, as being congruent together. And then with deliberate malice of forethought, making sure that I... What we tend to do is that we take those who are close to us for granted. So they get less time, whatever. So my, my, wife, my wife has helped me a lot to do that. You know, my, I, have th I have three daughters. Uh, they're all grown now and married 10 years and all that kind of stuff. But uh, because I was in medicine and ministry, and we sat down early and, and cracked out time to, that was their time. Where I couldn't, I couldn't do a funeral, I couldn't do a wedding, I couldn't go to the hospital. My daughters can, can tell you today the times that we, that was their time. And if I had to do something, I would have to ask them, you know, somebody has asked me to do whatever, can I do it? And I held myself to that. Because I realize that, you're right, sometimes, you know, there's only 24 hours in every day. And people like me, you know, <laughs> we will try to make it 28, but there's only 24. And, and if you, you know, if you neglect a part of your life, you end up paying for it. I've seen ministers who are so committed they have alienated their, their kids from the church. So I think you're right. You have to be deliberate about that. That what's the priority? Again, somebody who you answer to. You know, I had people like Bishop Brazier and others who every year I would go to them and say, okay, talk to me about my life. What do you see? What do, you, do, you, what do, you, what do I need to be doing? What am I unaware of? Because that's really important because balance is really, real health is balance. It's not being so gung-ho, you know. It, we all know about the case of a young man that went to the, in, the islands in, in India to convert those people and was killed. I think that was poor judgment. His heart was totally pure. But again, I, I think that somebody should have given him better advice. Maybe they would have, I don't know. My point is that, again, you're right. You have to have balance, and balance is critical. How do you define it? It changes. You know, at this, at this stage in my life, balance is different than it was when I was 25. You know, I realize that, too, that different seasons of life, different priorities, and hopefully you have people who love you around you that will help you to understand that, and that we, we hear them. Yes, ma'am. Can you speak a little bit into how you coped with um, some of the burden that you allowed to take on of those families and those families yeah. that you lost? Um, are there certain disciplines in your life that help with that? Or yeah, that's that's a that's an excellent question. You know, nothing is without cost. Even you know that's that's the word sacrifice, right? Yeah. Um, I'll give you, give you an, an analogy to it. When, when we, at Children, when we, the first time we opened up a floor that was dedicated to cancer patients, we thought we were doing better. Before that, we had nine floors in the hospital. So depending on your age, if you had cancer, you went to a different floor by your age. When we opened up the dedicated floor, within six months, we began to have all kinds of problems with the staff and with people, and we realized, oh my God, they're dealing only with cancer patients. So we had to develop uh, a weekly meeting where you just sat down with your colleagues and talked about your patients. And if you lost a patient, you had to have counseling for at least <coughs> an hour every six weeks to talk about that because there are burdens. So yeah, my colleagues who were concerned about me were rightly concerned because you can take on, you can be overloaded. And, and so I like to think I, I had people who would help me not take on too much because, you know, I'm a, I'm a, kind of driven person. So my wife and my administrator at the church then and others really had to, had to take from me my ability to, to set my own schedule. That happened about 18 years ago. They took from me, they said, let, let us help you live. How? You cannot set your schedule because you don't know how to say no. And they helped me. So yeah, you need those people. And, and who you listen to, again, you know, my wife was, for me, has been great, you know, when she told me, you know, you, you, you're getting tired. No, I'm not. Yeah, you don't notice you're getting short with people. This is happening. So you have, if, if you live within your own self alone, it, it's a problem. You have to have people that love you enough to tell you the truth in that, that you don't want to hear and, and that you train yourself to listen to those people. Because, right, 
we have a lot of burnout in medicine. In some of the very stressful areas of medicine, people really get burned out and suicides are real. The stress is, is, is real. And so you want to address those things as well. Yes, ma'am. You know, things yeah. Like that. I think, yeah. You know, those are hard uh, things, but again, you, you have to devise a program that is healthy. Um, again, my wife and others, you know, years ago said to me, okay, you're going to take off a certain number of days every few months, whether you want to or not. And in those things, I found out that I needed those times, even though I, I didn't think I needed them. I can, I can tell you this, this is years ago when my wife said, you need to see a therapist. I said, are you crazy? <laughs> me, Dr. Smith. And she convinced me to see somebody who I, she knew I had respect for. And I remember the time I went to see that person. And, they, and, and this person was really sharp. I mean, I look back now and said, boy, she's really smart. So she talked about, you know, I, I know who you are. Tell me about what you do, you know. And I'm Dr. Smith, and I work at the hospital, you know. And I have a church, and we're doing all these things. Tell me more about that. She, Went on and on. She said, boy, you know, you help a lot of people. What do you do? I said, you know, I minister to them. You know, I counsel them. She said, boy, that's really great. She said, so who does that for you? I know she had trapped me. It wasn't, <laughs> no, it wasn't fair. She said, for the next eight weeks, I want you to come once a week. She said, I know what you're going to ask me. What's the agenda? She said, there is no agenda. You just come. That changed my life, too. First time I came, I was very squeamish, you know, whatever. Started talking about the, about the second and third time. I looked forward to that time. I realized, wow, I can just talk and share. So you've, you've got to develop. I, I believe that people who are highly committed have to have a structure and people that keep them from themselves, that allow you to be balanced and, and can speak to you in a definitive way. And you have to, in my book, Leighton Ford, some of y'all know who Leighton Ford is, it was Billy Graham's brother-in-law. Leighton Ford wrote a forward to my book. He's one of my greatest mentors in how to understand accountability in a positive way. Because if you don't, you can destroy your own self doing good. You guys are so easy to talk to. <laughs> yes. And, and you're, going, you're going to find that. I mean, you do know that, um, by and large, the, these fields have been separate. I think as we understand things better, we know that they shouldn't be. I mean, look, about, look what we've learned about uh, neurogenic disease uh, in, in the last 20, 30 years, and things like serotonin and dopamine that, we, that in our church we call what well, they're demon-possessed. No, they weren't. They had an imbalance of... Neurotransmitters. And how do you know? Because on their medicine, they're perfectly normal. So th there's going to be, you know, when, when you push against the norm, you're not going to always be well received. So you have to have at least some resiliency. But, but there are organizations who are looking for I got I, I didn't just go to Yale. I got called by Yale a few years ago and, and, and at the, uh, the cancer center there. And they said, look, we want you to come and talk to us about, you know, how do you at the empathetic healing part to what we do. And I said, well, you know, these are people in the field. They said, no, 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 we want you. He said, we, we, we watched you from a distance. We know who you are. And I was shocked. They knew my whole, whole portfolio. They said, we know where you've lectured. We know your background. You know, so my point is that there's somebody out there who's looking for what God has for you to do. And then that begin to open doors for others. Because it's amazing once they know, I've been to U of C and I've been to Yale. Oh, now we want you to come here. So you, you have to not be turned off by their resistance. It's normal. People say they like to change, they don't. Change is difficult. But sometimes, somebody has to be the ones to, that God uses to open those doors. Even in our churches now, we have ministries now that culturally before we would never have, but we have them now. 
you, you, you gotta you, you gotta have a thick skin yet a compassionate mind mm -hmm. yeah but so it comes with the territory yes ma'am have you ever had a patient ask you if, if there's a god why am i going through i've had worse than that mm -hmm. again so i can remember you know i, I ran a sickle cell unit at Northwest for, for years so I remember when we first began to develop what we call, some of you are familiar with this, um, minimally invasive bone marrow transplants where they don't require a six of the six uh, HLA match. You can have almost a, a partially mismatched transplant and still do well. And I remember the first child that we had that went through that program, this is 20 some years ago, she was a twin. Uh, these two girls were African-American and Hispanic, they were beautiful. One was a stewardess, the other one had terrible disease. And so, you know, they said, they enrolled her in our, in our study. And I remember doing the transplant, she did well. And then she developed graft host disease. She developed diabetes because her pancreas went out and she got skin disease and her face sloughed off. She, and I remember her dying and her mother found me in the clinic Said, I just want, I want to talk to you because I know I can talk to you. I said, fine. She said, I want to ask you one question. Why does my daughter have to die? And I had no answer. So I learned how to walk with people. There's a word in, in the Bible that describes the Holy Spirit called, in the Greek, called parakletus. It means to come alongside. And the Lord helped me to understand that and with other people that sometimes you won't have the answer. And people will question their faith, but they're just, they're human. They said, what do you do? You sit there with them, you hold their hand, you cry with them, you weep with them, and understand that they are human. They, don't, they need somebody to walk alongside with them. Will it make it perfect? No. And that young girl died. She did. If, if you work in these fields, you will have reflections of regret. You ask, what, what, what could I have done? Sometimes you did all you can do. But you know, at the end of the day, we're not God. We're human vessels. So you have to be able to accept those things and not become callous. Uh, is your faith challenged? Yeah, I can tell you. I've, I've seen infants born with retinoblastoma bilateral where they have to have both eyes enucleated. You know, in the Bible, when the guy was born blind, they asked Jesus, who did sin, this man or his parents? He said, neither one of them. Neither one. It's not a result of you know. The sin in the garden that caused us to be flawed is a real deal. It will never be totally redeemed until we go back to be with Christ. You know, we're going to have issues here in our bodies, mind, and spirit. My, our faith really designed help us to walk in the valleys and not lose our minds and hope not lose our faith. There'll be challenges. Hey, guys. I'm enjoying tonight, and I'll say a little while at the end if you want to have personal questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good to be a part.